Welcome to Resounding, a podcast exploring the power of the arts in advocacy and in action. We talk with artists and activists, taking a deep dive into questions surrounding the causes of displacement, the strength and the vulnerability of people on the move, and the potential of the arts to shine a light on social justice and impact people's lives for the better. My name is Laura Hassler, and in this episode, I spoke with Khaukha Tabang, a Hazaran songwriter and vocalist from Afghanistan, currently living in Norway, and with Jan Lothe Eriksson, the founder of Safe News, an organization providing safe haven and support to censored and persecuted artists. Kaucha's latest EP, called Landless Tree, is available now via Safe News' dedicated label, Lidio. Hello, and Jan, welcome to this uh, resounding podcast. So lovely to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Shall we start with the music? Uh, can you tell us something something about your relationship to music, your background with music, and what you're doing with your songs? Yeah, actually, I uh, professionally started my music uh, since uh, 2015. But before that, when I was a child, I was always used to singing, but... Um, as we we were living in a like religion country like Afghanistan and Iran, so we used to as a students uh, singing Quran or this kind of music, not not music in that way that I I am doing right right now. Mm-hmm. So um, I was in several school, and in each each school that I went, I started to sing it with singing with microphone. I I was in love with microphone, but uh, yeah. Our school was just uh, one g- gender, like just just girls, so we were allowed to sing in, but just like as I say. Also, se- also secular songs. You were allowed to sing secular songs as well, or just uh, religious. No, 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 just, just religious songs. Okay. Yeah, but I didn't know that I can be a musician or I'm a singer. I I, I didn't I didn't have any idea about these things. So. I, I used to study a lot and questioning about what, why everything is like this. And it was forbidden in our countries and on that area, uh, having that, that kind of question that why I can't be like a boy, why I can't have that kind of freedom that a boy had. So it was very difficult for me to figure it out that how can I understand something. So I chose to be a lawyer in uh, in university. It was really difficult for me because my fa- we didn't have any girl before me to uh, to be able to go to university. So it mm. was the first challenge that I had with my family and uh, they didn't want me to go. So they put something, uh, some rules that if you have like top grades, you can go to university. So I got it and I went to university. And in university, I think my first challenge started because uh, everything was unreasonable and it wasn't any logic because the law should be logic for me because mm-hmm. uh, they are saying that we are making equal things and we are we, are, we want to find or and make a good world for us. But for me, it wasn't like this and uh, I, I didn't satisfy on that field so i i find art sorry to interrupt you but can you tell me were you still singing in this time where all this time just for myself or my friends you know not not that that kind of way so uh mm-hmm. when they they uh put pressure on me in universities that you you couldn't have this kind of situation for example i had a lot of questions in, in my teacher Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was really dangerous to having on that area that question about Islam, for example, or, or about gender, or about why we are uh, we are living like this, why we can't have that kind of life that another people in another land they have. Uh, so I understand that I can't have any in, impact in that social. I, I I can't do anything if I go to the parliament if I if I be able to be. Uh, part of member of parliament in Afghanistan, 
uh, my future will be, will be like Malala Juya is a woman from Afghanistan. Is she is really brave and she did really great things for Afghanistan, but at the end she is alone and, and you know uh, they they just removed her. They attacked her. So I was like, okay, this is not my area and this is not my place and I can't have anything here. So I choose to find another way through the theater. I was starting to singing. And I had first challenge with myself because it, I was at that moment very religiously because of the, you know, like we are growing up like this. So I choose to be against of uh, rules and against of uh, feeling that social gave, make for me, made for me before. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I went to the, some courses uh, to be able to singing, but in, in a hidden life, in underground. Uh, so my family, they didn't know at first that I'm doing this, uh, this stuff. Uh, and it was really difficult because I should, you know, I should act in like two faces. I didn't have like, uh, for some, uh, some time in routine, I hide my real life and I censor all of things that I was doing at the moment and I was another person while I, I went back to the home you know I was like okay I'm that good student in university and I'm not oh, going to that yeah so you were officially at the, still at the university studying law yeah but you were you were uh, a, a guerrilla singer you were singing you were singing <laughs> yeah. uh, in or and doing theater secretly yes yeah. And and where were you where were you studying theater then and and and, and singing? So uh, how was... It was underground courses that the, it wasn't like officially or formal yeah. uh, place. It was just gathering with friends that they know more than me and they were all like, oh, yeah. yeah. So they they start to pushing me that you you can be a great artist if you just uh, change your field. Mm. Uh, so th when my family they understand that I am in another part of uh, you know uh, educating like art educating, mm -hmm. uh, they start to, to make another decision for me, which has had a lot of effect on my life I, in my uh, private life because uh, you know for example in the our culture when they understand that there is something happening for a girl, and it's the like red flag for them. They mm -hmm. start to choose to put you in a marital state, you know, first marriage like this. So they warn me that if you're doing and continue these kind of things, uh, you should you should soon as soon as possible you should get a married. You shouldn't be a single girl. Oh, so they, they saw this as a threat. There's, yeah. there's some of your okay. And just to ask in between, because I listened to another interview with you or a conversation and. Somewhere you said your mother always loved singing, but she didn't know it. Still, she she doesn't know right now. She's singing uh -huh. while she is working during the uh -huh. you know break and uh, cooking and cleaning. Yes. she doesn't know that she's a, she can be a great singer, but you know it's because of the big, huge brainwashing. The social pressure keeps yeah. her from yeah. seeing that as something that you could be doing with your life. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I had that kind of uh, experience also before when I came to the through the Save Me as Help and Icor uh, organization to Norway. Before in 2019, I was in uh, Greece uh, as a refugee, as asylum seeker. Sorry. Then I had another experience to understand that what is the Western world. Before for me, it was just imagination that there is a lot of people that they are living together and they have a lot of freedom. But then when I went to Greece, my eyes just open and I understand that now all of the world is just, it, it's, it's just another shape of sensor. Or, so I was so young and I understand that, no, there is, there is nothing. It, it doesn't matter when, where you are living. It's, right. it's important that how you are doing your job and how do you want to influence or impact people that you're around of their living and you want to talk with them. Yes, so another shape of censorship. Yeah, interesting, interesting, and so true. And can I ask, can I bring Jan into this conversation now to tell us more about Safe Muse? You referred to Safe Muse in, in Norway, where you are now, if I'm yeah. correct. Yes, yeah. Jan, tell us about Safe Muse. What is Safe Muse? How did it start? And what is your mission and what are you doing? Safe Muse started out 
by inspiration from Freemuse and the documentation work Freemuse is doing. So we saw that lots of artists around the globe had big problems. I used to be a musician a few lives ago. Uh, and um, so we started out as a music initiative. I went to the Musicians Union here in Norway and asked if they could be the stepstone to, to establish some, some, some organization to help uh, solidarity, give solidarity to, to persecuted musical artists. So we started out uh, in 2011 to prepare, and in 2013 we established together with a, with a NUPA, the Popular Music Composers and Lyricists. Uh, and from there we, we uh, have built Safe Muse to be um, an organization catering or developing residencies for, for persecuted, censored, artists uh, now within all fields we started with music so we run residencies but when we started out we also uh, planned to do uh, a parallel program to what icon at that point was doing mostly for writers so so uh, two-year programs and uh, but but we didn't get the new in norway when when icon guests are coming they come as refugees uh, so they come as part of the refugee program and we didn't get the the official authority to do that kind of program in norway so we continued just doing re short term residencies but in the startup we had a very close relation to uh Hasta, the city of Hasta up north in norway and and uh, the 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 municipality there and from since then, we have been working very closely with the guest artists coming to Hasta. So from the first one coming in 2014 and up now to Raucha, we've been working with, with programming for these artists. We've been doing records with them and, and doing concerts and programming. In addition to what we do uh, within the within the, the the residency programs, we're now running a residency program in Oslo, supported by Oslo City, and and also developing another one outside Oslo. Can you say a little bit about what such a residency looks like uh, for an artist, or maybe both of you, because one is organizing, the other yeah, is part of it. Um, uh, we invite artists that are persecuted, censored because of their art. And yeah. and uh, what we do now in Oslo, we have an open call. We opened this program last year. We have then money to invite two artists for six month programs. And we had 120 applicants for those two mm -hmm. placements. So it says enough. It's, it there is a huge need also for these short stays. So what we do mm -hmm. is we assess, of course, the artists, if it is uh, people we think we can give something back to, 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 to prepare a program together with. So we start the preparations before they come and try to mm -hmm. line up uh, the main kind of, of uh, framework, what they should do when they come here. And uh, we put great effort in making this an artistic residency, not just a placement and a house and food, but also artistic programming. So right now we are having a Chinese theater uh, artist here. He's working on some film uh, project and also a visual artist from, from Belarus. And she's doing her artwork. She's been uh, exhibiting and, and developing projects while she's here. And then of course with, with Rauran, when she came, we, uh, we uh, have, uh, uh, invited her for making uh, a record. The first step was this EP we uh, we put out now in March, and hopefully we will find some money to to develop a full album for her. We've done the same with other musicians coming to Hasta earlier. So mm -hmm. that is the one major foot we are standing on. The other foot is to promote artistic freedom. Uh, we do some national mm -hmm. events, and also we are involved in in an international network organization, Safe Haven Freedom Talks, uh, and we are doing this uh, this annual conference uh, network gathering 
called Safe Havens. We did last now in December in Mexico City, gathering some 140 mm -hmm. people, uh, artists and, and, and organizations uh, to, to discuss matters around artistic freedom. Wonderful. So that's what we do. It's very interesting because I work for Musicians Without Borders and we're always working with musicians and artists, but we're often flying under the radar because the emphasis is not so much on performing or speaking out, but more on empowering people who have been disempowered by usually war and armed conflict. So it's, it's, it's a different, but, but there's such a link. It's so strong because we were, you know, talking earlier about truth telling and, um, and, and collaboration and working with artists around the world. So, so how, how has this been for you, this residency? What does it look like for you? Um, at, at first, I should say that uh, I should explain because I was uh, I don't know about another artist that they are uh, include of in this uh, network in Safe Muse, but for me it was such a big gift that I was always searching for that because as a young girl that I was singing in Afghanistan or in another country like Iran, Turkey, Greece, uh, I had a lot of suggestion from another company or another uh, groups and bands that they suggest me to collaborate with them or, or have a contract with them. But uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, the most, uh, the most uh, or important reason was for me that there is a corrup corruption there and uh, they want to guide my music and my content of music. And uh, they don't accept me as an artist they, they want object inside that mostly, and not all of them, but the, the suggestion that I had, it was like this. So I used to use my uh, phone and simple song, but uh, unfortunately, social media has bad things and also has good things. So I had that kind of things that uh, through the social media, uh, publish my simple songs with just with just one guitar and with just my face and while I'm singing. So it has impact, uh, fortunately, and I was so happy. But mostly my audience was searching, that was asking why you are not recording your voice professionally in a studio. Uh, and I had my answer that I don't, ca and I can't find any company that I can uh, trust them. So, yeah, I'm so lucky that I find uh, Safe Muse and Jan and this network and I really, really, really be, uh, wish that another artist that they are thinking like me and they are searching for this can be uh, find this kind of net network. It's amazing. I mean, you were talking about coming to Greece and then discovering that there's many different kinds of censorship. And it sounds like there were people who really wanted to take advantage of you and just use your voice to promote whatever it was that they wanted to say, right? So, so that's, that's a very interesting sort of aspect of this whole conversation, I think, is how, how, how do artists find a place where they can really tell the truth with their art? And how do organizations find ways to support artists in doing so? And I think those are, those are the really golden questions here. And Jan, can you tell me, are there similar organizations to Safe Muse in other countries? Do you have a network of organizations doing this kind of work or are you unique in this? There are lots of organizations working with artists, but, um, and, and we have this big network, but, but I think um, maybe others should, should say this, but I think our, we are put up by artists. I used to be a musician. Other people working at Safe News have, have other art form backgrounds. Uh, so it's a kind of a artist solidarity uh, organization. Also, we are organized as a membership organization. So Norwegian arts organization and institutions are members. So we are in a kind, in a way, um, put up by artists for artists. I don't know if there are any other organization like Safe News. There are others uh, offering uh, uh, placements, offering residencies, and there are safe spaces also put up by artists, but but mm -hmm. not in the same way, I think. But of course, when Raura says what she's saying, that 
yeah, we had the the fortune of of having some funding coming in for her for her recordings, so we could rent time in a in a in a studio and and have musicians coming in working with her. But for that, we need funding, and in that sure. uh, uh, we compete with all other artists in Norway. We have some beautiful schemes here in Norway where people can apply for support, but we are working with professional people, so we pay them and that's costly uh, so we need funding to do this kind of projects yeah it's hard to win that lottery so hopefully we will have some more money coming in to do more recordings with with uh, with Raucha. we also done uh, in not in the same way because uh, you have a, a previous uh, podcast with mike Hoy. we also released her record but that was done in mm -hmm. in uh, hanoi before she came in a residency here. So, so right. and we've been working with other artists as well, doing recordings and, and also doing other art projects. This is something that I feel about our organization anyway, within a, a field of organizations, is that there being a lot of musicians in it helps us to be really creative, also organizationally, that there's this kind of spirit of looking for opportunities and entering them and being able to do more things than other people would be able to with yeah limited amounts of funding yeah. or the what you can find so do, does that resonate with you, yeah. do you does that do you recognize absolutely. that absolutely but but um you know uh, the artists we meet like raura and others coming in is also a huge resource and i think being yes. an artist running an organization you see that maybe more clearly and have the possibility to to open doors for the artist to guest artist to to be that kind of resource also for the environment they are visiting or, or uh, like like the people Raura worked with in in the studio they love to work with her because she brings in mm. new ideas also so that's a huge um, that's a huge gift being in the kind of position we are to have these people coming in and and uh, work with them and also see that like Raura flourishing in in the studio it's it's uh, it's beautiful Amazing. And have there there been some concerts? I imagine also you've performed as well in Norway, Hauka? Uh Yes, I had some concert and free concerts. Um, we had a, a concert, live concert in that EP that we, uh, yeah, release it, and also another place like in Hashda in Oslo. And you should have had many more. So maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's yeah. that's also. I mean, it's. I would have loved to have resources to be a proper a proper management and push. We have limitations. You can't we have limitations. Yeah, sure. sure. And and you, you mentioned this EP that you've just put out. And can you say something about these three beautiful songs, Halfa? To me it was kind of like a what would you call that a triptych? It's it's like it's like one story, yeah, or, or different chapters in the same story. Is that the way you imagined it or is that just me? whole of it it's about experience of the a group of people that they uh, live that they are living still in that situation so it's it's not just about me it's just it it's about his story that we have and uh, we are forgetting because of the situation this kind of uh history so uh, we did together in uh, at december in oslo that project and uh, my uh, goal was my target was to you know because because of this situation that we have in Afghanistan right now we are forgetting everything and uh, his story is repeating all the time in Afghanistan like just uh, warlord is going and coming and US uh, make a decision and again you know it's just the repeating it's a circle 
And uh, when you when you're just talking with people, that what do you feel? What do you think about the previous uh, moment that we had in Afghanistan, like democracy, or you know, that the, the first Taliban that took over the country? What do you think about this part of the history? And they are most of them. They are talking about, oh, it was really good. It was really better than right now, better than right now, always better than right now. Because we are not resourcing, we are not achieving, we are not, we don't have that enough books, we don't have enough arts, we are not making because of the war situation. So we are, you know, the first priority for us is to not, to do not be hungry. So as an artist outside of the country that I have this, I have some, you know, possibility so I was thinking that okay for example one of the song is a lullaby for Hazara people and uh, it's it's remind the big history that we had and it's it's hopeful that saying that you I wish you come back I want you come back to this place this place is belong to you so while you are as an Hazara or as an another a native in the world, whole world, you're you're listening to that and understanding what is the lyric about, you know, colonization or what is the result of uh, putting war in a in a land that you and you want you know it's like all the politician things that is happening in Afghanistan. So yeah, this EP is not just about me; it's just a huge history of uh, people from Afghanistan. Obviously, I don't understand the the original text, but I've read the English translation, and it's so it clearly about history, but it's also so beautifully poetic that and so recognizable. And the music itself is also so engrossing and almost magical. You know, to me, this is a, this is a, this is the gift of of a great musician who's also a, a great storyteller, so that you can tell these stories in a way. That people can recognize them, even if you don't come from that particular place, but from that particular culture, and this sense of having lost something, and the sense of longing for something that is at the at the heart of what was lost. And I think that many people can relate to that in many different ways. So you're telling truth at so many different levels, then, and I I find that very um, moving and inspiring to just not only to hear this beautiful music and the ways that you're Yeah, exploring new ways of making music, also clearly, but also just the poetry of your of your of your texts are are is so beautiful. I think everybody should listen to your music. And <laughs> <laughs> about landless tree, it was really I have a uh, it's it's really weird for me because I was in Oslo and uh, there is one musician that we we supposed to go to perform it 
in mm-hmm. National Jazz Sense. And uh, she said that she's from Greece. And I said, oh, Landless Tree, part of that music, I made it while I was in uh, one of the islands in Greece. And I, w- and I had that feeling while I was in Greece. And I was like, there is no place that I feel that I'm blinder, you know, there is no place that I'm always between. And it's it's so bad. And it, in another perfect perspective can, can give you power that you can belong yourself to all the world, you know. And she said that she burned in Norway and uh, she is from Greece, her parents. And mm-hmm. she can connect, she can understand this music as I feel that. So it was really, for me, amazing that, oh, my God. So it's not just about me and my experience. It's, it's, it can relate. It. People can understand it, even that they are not from Middle East, you know. So there is something about community of artists in exile, whether you are literally in exile or whether you are in, a, in exile because your art gives you a vision that doesn't fit in the society where you are. So we had a conversation with Mr. Fish, this amazing cartoonist from um, the U.S., and he he was talking about life in that sense of of being alienated from the place that you are, of having to speak the truth. And so I'm curious about this idea of a, of, of community and, and community of artists who, one way or another, whether literally or maybe spiritually, you could say, feel exiled from somewhere. And can is it possible to to do more to create community among us in that sense? Just one thing just I remember, I don't know why right now I just remember this, but uh, there is very uh, special things that I feel about music that music there's it, it's another language for all of people. You don't need to understand exactly the word you know while you're listening, you can understand the feeling and direct feeling if if it's if it could be uh, you know so uh, you don't need to understand for example i used to listen to another language music so but i i didn't understand completely that what what they are singing about but i i could feel that uh, so i think um music is it's a tool or maybe it's a equipment for people to listening to each other without any words, but you know, it's it just the feeling. And you know, this is probably also why all these old men, mostly men, are so scared. I don't understand, but I just see men are scared, especially of females, strong females, uh, using art or like Laura using her music. It's a very strong force music and art as so because um, it moves directly souls yes that's the reason for keeping up and it 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 connects and builds empathy and that is the biggest antidote for fear if if i may add because you asked about this making communities for artists and making artists meet Mm -hmm. that is one of the ideas we are doing with the safe haven project where we put together artists from from many places uh, on the globe actually and what what they experience because artists are often very lonely in the, i mean artists in in afghanistan or in every, anywhere uh, they are not organized they are doing their work they are striving with their things very much individually or in small groups they are not organized so when they get in contact with networks like safe havens or other they can see okay here are other people in the same kind of Mm -hmm. situation that mental thing that you know people other places knows about you and cares about you and then even get together and discuss and maybe create art together it's it's a it's a fantastic thing it's very powerful and I mean, we have the tools for this now, right? We we can connect across borders. We don't have to travel in order to be in contact with people. And yeah, especially when you're talking about, when you just express yourself with another musician, 
you understand oh you're not you you're not the only one that thinking that way or feeling that way so when you have that communication that's uh, yeah luckily i have this communication right now in norway i didn't have that experience before in afghanistan it was uh, as uh, jan told it's it's impossible ex- especially for women if you just show up that you are a singer so mm. there is a lot of uh, dangerous situation will make for you so You shouldn't tell anybody. You should be in your comfort zone or corner. Uh, mm-hmm. so, but here it's uh, totally different. When you're speaking out and you're talking about your feeling, so you can understand that oh, I'm not alone, and I can create that part in another way. So you know, it's it's a huge gift, I think, and it is so necessary. Absolutely, and I think also that we also have to be aware of the fact that I mean, I remember my co saying in our interview that. Um, when she she's in Pittsburgh in the U.S., that there are also places where she cannot perform. They, they won't invite her because they don't want her to speak out. There's also a kind of a censorship of some some messages we don't want to get out, and and so we won't give you a, a platform. So I think that something like what Safe Muse is doing of giving people a, a, a platform, helping them to helping musicians and other artists to create art that can be shared and shown. That's just invaluable. This is this is incredibly important. And Safe Me is also have a network for female network that we are all gathering after like two or three months and talking about our issue and how we can do something together and be knowing each other and you know having access to Uh, our art and how we can, you know, it's 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 really amazing. So, so maybe this is a nice place just to ask you both where our listeners can find your work. Obviously, Safe Muse, they can Google it, but maybe there's something more you want to say about that. And how how where can people listen to your amazing music? Well, uh, SafeMuse.org is a start. Uh, Rauha's music is on on uh, Bandcamp for the time being. We haven't put it out elsewhere, but I think we will soon. Bandcamp is a bit more. You don't get screwed when you have your music out at Bandcamp like you you get <laughs> other places, but you don't right. reach that so broadly. But we started out putting it out at Bandcamp, but but probably it will be around elsewhere. So you will reach it through Safe Muse or directly at Bandcamp and search up. Uh, yeah, I urge everybody to do that, to look up Safe Muse, to support them, and to look for Kauha's music on the Safe Muse website and then on Bandcamp. I could just add also, of course, Kauha has her own uh, YouTube channel. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, and we will we will share those links on the with the notes under this this uh, podcast. Thank you so very much for this conversation, and uh, let's. Definitely stay in touch. I think we have a lot of common ground. Absolutely, and thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, it was a real blessing to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Resounding is brought to you by the Art Twenty Seven Network, a network of like-minded initiatives using art and culture to respond to the ongoing crisis of displacement of human beings in Europe and around the world. To find out more and to join our growing network, you can visit our website, art27.art, or follow us on Facebook at Art27. This podcast was produced and edited by Ed Holland. The theme tune was written by Matteo Galesi in collaboration with Sinker. Thank you for listening.